Well, it's certainly great to be with you today. And as we enter into God's presence, I want to read a passage of scripture that I think is so powerful. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more today in the teaching. But before we do that, um, we will spend some time singing and then we'll engage in teaching. But with that being said, I want to read this passage of scripture to you found in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Listen to the words of it. It says, the sun, meaning Jesus, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Isn't that a powerful passage of scripture to be called into worship to exalt Jesus? Jesus is the one that sustains all things. The exact representation of, of the Father Himself. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. The exact rep re, uh, representation, expression of God, sustaining all things, because He is God, sustaining all things. And not only that, but accomplishing the purification of sins and see, seated at the right hand of the Father. What a powerful verse that reminds us of who we are worshiping today. And I pray that's what would happen. We would truly worship Him, exalt Him, and bring Him the glory that He so deserves.
Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. From slave to deputy Pharaoh. We're going to talk about the life of Joseph today. We're, what, we're uh, in this big series, 31-week series called The Story. Uh, we've been in it for a couple of weeks now, and I hope and pray that you have been engaging in it. I hope and pray that you've been rising up to the challenge of, of, of spending time in, in God's Word by doing the uh, re- weekly reading. Um, again, just the uh, small snippets of reading that we all can certainly manage um, and engage with Yahweh, God Himself, through the reading of His Word, um, and then also uh, through um, coming and being a part of worship, either online or in person, and spending time with your family. If you have a family, if, uh, if you got young kids, that you are uh, asking them some of the questions, because uh, if they are doing the E3 Kids ministry here uh, on campus, they are talking about the same thing. And so I just pray that you're rising up to the challenge. I pray that you also do the QR code or hope, pray, whatever, that you do the QR code as well and answer those questions. There's just three questions, and they're just questions that can um, enable us to drill down a little bit more and think a little bit more deeply, introspect maybe a little bit more, and just engage. Uh, Again, we're not looking to gain more information, but we're looking to uh, become to know God more relationally, okay? Not just informationally, but relationally. And so we've been in this, uh, we started this a couple of weeks ago, the, the story. And right, you know, at the beginning, we, we talked about creation, uh, how God created all things. We, we talked about the fall, which means sin entered into the world where Adam and Eve chose to go their own way, exercise their own dominion or freedom, if we could say that. And they didn't go along with God. And so what happened is they brought sin into the world, which sin is, destroys, it um, separates, it, it just does all, has all this negative implications upon God's creation. And so now, uh, probably the biggest thing that, it's, that it did was it created this chasm, this relational chasm between mankind, humanity, God's creation, and Himself. And the only way that can be restored is not by us. There's nothing that we can do, but it's by God Himself, Yahweh Himself, providing a way for um, that relationship, that chasm to be restored. And only He can do that. And so that is the gist of the the Bible. That's the story. Uh, Clear back in Genesis 3, when sin entered into the world, uh, we read uh, about, uh, really see the first prophecy of a Messiah coming into the world. Uh, And that's God's plan of restoring um, uh, and providing redemption to humanity between Him, Himself, and his creation. And so we, that's what we're reading about, uh, and, and, and we're seeing how God is going to make that happen. And so again, we talked about, in the, at the beginning, we talked about uh, the creation, the fall of man, and then we talked about the flood and how God regretted created mankind because of sin, uh, sin being now passed down to every person a- after Adam and Eve. And then we talked about the Tower of Babel and how God confused them so that they wouldn't just continue on in their own uh, degenerate way that was uh, you know, serving no purpose whatsoever. And so then we pick back up on this, this story. Last week we talked about God coming to Abraham and um, we looked at Abraham's faith. How could he know, you know? And so we looked at that uh, Genesis 12 and we read about how God came to Abraham and said, this is what I'm going to do. And so he's kind of laying out this, his plan of what's going to take place and God's going to build a, a nation and, and through that group of people, the Messiah will come. And so it's starting way back here with Abraham. We, we, we read that Abraham was really old, him and Sarah. They were past childbearing years. They didn't have any kids, but yet God um, gives him this promise, this covenant, and to the point to where, you know, Abraham's like, I, I, this doesn't make sense. And so he asks, how will I know? And that was the million-dollar question. And God, uh, through a vision, basically uh, made, a co- again, a covenant, a promise with Abraham, saying, that, you know, and we talked about this, where they passed through uh, the animals that had been slaughtered and divided in half. And, and again, this was symbolism. And God saying to Abraham, I'm making this covenant with you, and if I don't fulfill it, the curse is on me. And so now we see that God is going to make this plan happen. And, we can, and, and Abraham had faith. He trusted in God. Now, that doesn't mean he was perfect. He wasn't some superhuman. He certainly had his ups and downs. 
uh, just like you and I. But the point of that is Abraham trusted, even though it didn't make sense. And remember, you know, God made this promise and it didn't get fulfilled for, what, another 24, 25 years? Uh, that's really putting your faith to the test. But we see that Abraham did have that type of faith, right? And God made the covenant and said, this is on me. And so Abraham trusted in God and said, okay, this is, you know, I trust you. And so today we're going to pick back up on that theme. And, and, and again, we're jumping around. We're hitting the highlights. So again, I pray that you are reading your, doing your weekly reading to kind of stay engaged. And so uh, we read about, um, you know, we read about these guys, Abraham, having some, he finally has a son by the name of Isaac, right? Uh, you remember he had another son by the name of Ishmael, but that was not God's blessing. That was Abraham and Sarah trying to uh, fulfill God's plan, but that's not that was not God's plan. That God was not going to uh, work through the line of Ishmael, but He was going to create you know a, a miracle per se with Isaac, and the Messiah will come through the bloodline of Isaac. And so Abraham has some sons. Um, Isaac is one of them, and, and so then Isaac has some sons. If we would read you know, more in depth, Isaac had some sons, Jacob and Esau, and we read about that. And then Jacob had a bunch of sons. He had 12, you know, and so that was, that's a great story. And if you can go back and read that sometime and unpack that, because each of his sons represents a tribe um, of Israel, and they will compose the, of the nation. So as that family grew, they became Israel. As, you know, that's the nation we see uh, essentially today. And so, but, so we pick up kind of on Jacob and his, some of his sons. And his oldest was Reuben. We read about him and Simeon. Uh, you know, there's a, there, and there's a, again, I don't want to get out through the list of them, but uh, he had 12 sons, one of them being Joseph, one of the youngest being Joseph. And Joseph was the firstborn to his, his the, the wife that he truly, truly loved, Rachel, if you remember that whole story. Um, and so um, that is who... That is who um, um, Jacob was very much, um, he, he really favored Joseph is what happened. He really favored Joseph. Now, those of you that have siblings, you get this, right? There is some rivalry that can take place, okay? And, you know, especially from the younger one trying to usurp authority or trying to, I remember one time when our kids were growing up, um, you know, I just kind of, let them do their thing. You know how kids have a high, there's a hierarchy, right? And so I remember one time, uh, Leah is our oldest. She always would come up for dinner, whatever. Uh, if they were all coming upstairs, she would always lead the pack up. You know, she was the oldest, okay? Well, you got Ryan that's about two doors down, and he would always try to usurp that and try to, you know, just test it. And I remember she would just, she would just pound on him, you know? <laughs> And I remember my wife getting upset with me because, you know, she would just kind of pound on him a little bit. I'm like, hey, he, he's got to learn his lesson, right? And so in our story today, that's what we kind of see. We see Joseph. Uh, but it, it, and when we read the story, we do kind of look at it and we say, what is God up to? This is kind of odd, right? This is kind of odd. But Joseph was one of the youngest, and he, he was, um, his other brothers were jealous of him because Jacob showed him a lot of favor, uh, favoritism, right? He, uh, he gave him a coat. Uh, he put him in charge. Had, Joseph had a lot of leadership uh, abilities that I believe God blessed him with. And so, you know, just to kind of do a thumbnail sketch of the whole story, if you remember, uh, Joseph has some dreams. Again, he's a very young kid. He's probably uh, maybe 17, if not a little bit younger. Uh, and he has these dreams uh, where the family is bowing down to him. His brothers is bowing down to him and worshiping him, you know. And then he has another dream where uh, his mom and dad is going to be worshiping him, right? Um, and I'm not going to go into all that detail, but he uh, brings these dreams, these visions, whatever it is, and he kind of unpacks it to his family. And you can only imagine how that went over. That didn't go over very well at all, okay? They already, his brothers already saw him as a threat, kind of, you know, and they were a bit jealous because uh, their father's love for him was pretty, pretty, uh, it seemed uh, greater for Joseph than the rest. But uh, so, anyhow, so Joseph unpacks these dreams, and uh, I think, you know, I, nevertheless, uh, his brothers are kind of jealous. And so, what happens is through a course of time, his brothers go off with the, with the herd of cattle and um, they go uh, to a different, they go to Shechem or wherever, and then they go to Dothan, if you, again, what did your weekly reading. And so uh, Jacob asks Joseph to go check out to see what's going on, you know, to see where his brother, you know, where his brothers are at with the, with the herd and 
um, such. And so Joseph puts on his coat and he goes. And he finally finds them in the land of Dothan. Um, and the water had dried, you know, there was a couple of wells there. One of them, uh, either both of them or one of them had dried up. And so as his brothers see him coming from a long distance away, if you read, uh, they, be, they, they started plotting. You know, why don't we just off him? Why don't we just kill him? Let's be done with this. You know what I'm saying? And so they take him, and, and one of them talks a little bit of sense. Reuben, the oldest, talks a little bit of sense, um, you know, and talks them out of killing him and, and saying, you know. And so, and so they take him, and they put him in a well, okay, one of these dry cisterns. There's no water in it, so they put him down in there so he can't escape. And, and so then what we read next is that instead of killing him, um, they decide to take him and sell him to the Ishmaelites, okay, Midianites and Ishmaelites. Uh, and again, that takes us back to Ishmael, Abraham, right? Um, so anyhow, they sell him to Ishmael. They sell their brother to Ishmael into slavery. So then Joseph gets, cut, you know, he's in slavery. They take him to Egypt. He gets sold a couple times there. He gets uh, into the house of, uh, of Potiphar who is, is, is in charge of, of the land, essentially. And so he, he is high up uh, you know, in leadership. And Potiphar trusts Joseph. And what's really interesting when we look at Scripture, if you would look real quick to chapter 39, um, I'm just going to bring it up here if I can find it now. If you look in chapter 39 too, it says this, The Lord was with Joseph. And he became a successful man serving in the household of his Egyptian master, who would have been Potiphar. So time and time again, we see this phrase, the Lord was with Joseph. And you look at this and you're like, what is God up to then? Why would God allow this to happen? Why would God allow his brothers to do this? I mean, wasn't that a bit extreme? Wasn't that a bit excessive to deal with the problem? And so we wonder, what's going on? What God's building a nation here? God's building a group of people, and this is how God is doing it? And you, you kind of sit back and you're like, you kind of scratch your head. But it says this, again, in verse 39 too, the Lord was with Joseph. So as he was in Potiphar's house, everything Joseph did, Joseph was successful. So consequently, what happened is Potiphar trusted him with all of his possessions, um, everything. And so uh, then we read about, Potiphar's wife having some feelings for Joseph and wants to go to bed with Joseph, and Joseph has integrity. So Joseph says, no, I'm not going to do that. That's, I'm, not going to, you know, I, I'm not going to do that against my God, and I'm not going to do that against my master who trusts me with everything that he has. So he takes off, and somehow his, his coat or cloak, something gets left behind. And so um, she takes it, and she runs out, and she starts, you know, makes a big deal about it. And then she tells her husband what happened. So then Joseph gets thrown in prison. And so as he's in prison... Um, he, again, um, if you look in verse 30, uh, chapter 39, verse 21, it says, But the Lord was with Joseph. And again, we see this. God was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. And then it says, He granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So as he was in prison, Joseph, he's in prison, literally. You know, and, and can you only imagine what he's thinking? You know, I'm in prison because of my integrity. So then, nevertheless, the prison, the prison warden sees him, uh, sees his leadership abilities because God is with him and God has extended him favor and everything he does becomes successful, even in prison. And so he rises him up and puts him in charge of things, okay? So then it says in verse 39, 23, it says, The warden did not bother with anything under Joseph's authority. Why? Because the Lord was with him and the Lord made him, made everything that he did successful. So God was with him, even though his life was kind of like this roller coaster, okay? And I'm just giving a big thumbnail sketch. There's so much more deep teaching when it comes to Joseph's life. But nevertheless, the Lord was with Joseph. And you can see that his life was like this ups and downs. So he's in prison. And you can only imagine that, that he's thinking, you know, what's, you know, what's going on? So as he's there, he, he does uh, interpret a couple dreams, um, of a couple individuals within the prison. No one else could, could interpret those dreams, so God gives him the ability to interpret these dreams. And he's just thinking, you know, with one of them gets out, surely they're going to say something, and, 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 and I'm going to get out of this place. You know, surely they're going to see, you know, uh, return the favor. Well, only one of them does. And so, but what happens is, uh, actually, he stays in prison, and so what happens is the Pharaoh has this dream. Okay, so when the Pharaoh has this dream, he, um, 
he looks to his people, and it's a very disturbing dream. It's kind of a nightmarish type dream. And so as he consults his counsel and all this, no one can interpret his dreams. Well, lo and behold, someone remembers. It was either Cupbearer or the baker, one of those, I can't remember. But one of them uh, goes to the Pharaoh and says, well, I know someone that interpreted dreams in prison that was, you know, that was spot on, and I'm just paraphrasing. And so the Pharaoh calls Joseph, and I, I find this very interesting too. And if you would turn to uh, chapter 41, Genesis chapter 41, verse 16, Pharaoh asks him, before this, Pharaoh asks him to interpret, he says, you know, I've heard that you can interpret dreams. And listen to what Joseph says to the Pharaoh. Joseph says this, I am not able to, Joseph answered Pharaoh. It is God who will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. I think it's very interesting how Joseph's life, even through all these ups and downs, he never lost his faith. He stayed in, in, in um, this close, this, having this, 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 this a strong faith in God himself. And so through all of this, this ups and downs, he kept the faith. And, and, and consequently, then what took place, then Joseph was able to uh, tell the Pharaoh about, you know, interpret his dreams and then and, and, and say, this is really going to happen. And he was talking about a famine. He talked about how Egypt was going to be blessed with all kinds of crops. But then there's going to be a time where there is going to be famine. And so uh, Joseph said, this is what, you know, this is what you kind of need to do because God again was with Joseph and showing him favor. And so Joseph, everything he did was successful. And so when he give, gave this information to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's like, I'm going to put you in charge. You seem to know what's going on. I'm going to put you in charge of all the crops in Egypt. And so what we see is we see Joseph rising to leadership to the second in command once again. It was like with Potiphar, now it's with the Pharaoh. There's none greater in the land of Egypt than the Pharaoh, and Joseph was second in charge, and he administered the food, the crops, the grains, all of that stuff, and he oversaw it, and he oversaw it through the, the bumper years uh, so that they could make it through the years of famine. And so that's how we see Joseph's life. And then we see the reuniting of his family coming over because there was famine uh, in the land that they were in. So his brothers come over. They didn't recognize him. And hopefully, again, I know I've said this many times, but hopefully you read the story. But what I want to do is I want to focus on Joseph here a second. Because when you look at his life, you kind of step back and you say, this really is odd. This doesn't make sense, right? How would his brothers sell him into slavery? Why would they do that? If God's hand is in Joseph's life, why would this take place? Why would they take him, put him in a pit, take his robe, put blood on it from an animal, sell him into slavery, take the robe back to their father Jacob and say, look, the wild beast killed him. Uh, we don't know what happened to him, which all along they did. They sold him into slavery. But nevertheless, why would God allow that to happen? And then why would God allow him to be taken to, uh, uh, you know, to Potiphar's house, and because of his integrity, he gets falsely accused, falsely indicted by Potiphar's wife, and then on top of that, he gets now gets put in prison for doing the right thing, and then while he's in prison, um, he does the right thing because God's favor is on him. But then he rises, you know, so he rises up, and then he kind of falls back down again because uh, the the you know he thought maybe these guys that he interpreted dreams for would speak on his behalf and he would be free, but that wasn't the case. But eventually. Pharaoh gets wind from one of them that, that he can't interpret dreams, so now he's back. Uh, uh, you know, his life is just like this, this ups and downs. Well, let's take a look at this for a second. I think there's things here that we, a couple things that, that's a takeaway. Number one, um, when we start looking at Joseph's life, now I'm not taking away from Joseph whatsoever, but I think what was happening, one way to look at this is this God was refining Joseph. God was refining Joseph. As I said before, Joseph was probably a, somewhat of a cocky teenager. His dad loved him so much, you know, really showed all this favoritism, and it made his brothers jealous. I can only imagine when he was, you know, telling them about the dreams and all this other stuff, that there was a sense of air about Joseph. Well, you can see here that God was probably using these times to kind of rub off and edge off who Joseph was, and, and really polish his character. And Joseph was submitting to that. Joseph was surrendering to that process. He didn't lose faith with God. He didn't step back and say, why me? He didn't step back and say, you know what? This doesn't make sense, God. This doesn't make sense how I do the right thing and become all bitter and reject God. But instead, I believe what took place was Joseph yielded to the process of, of God's refinement, spiritual refinement so that he could be used by God in a very powerful way. Uh, Joseph yielded to that. Joseph humbled to that. 
he had a contrite heart and he lived in that. And the first thing he had to do was to be able to, to win this sense of, if I could say, uh, dependence, meaning that I'm not going to be independent, I'm going to be dependent on God. And that was probably the first lesson that he had to realize, this self-reliance and being stripped of it, being stripped away, because he had nothing, if you think about it. He didn't have his family name. He didn't have money. He didn't have a coat. He didn't have freedom. He didn't have options. He was under the, um, he was under the mercy of, 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 of the situation. He had absolutely no options whatsoever. But yet, he submitted to entrust it, instead of trusting in himself and becoming more independent and bitter, he became dependent upon God. What, you know, and so that's what, you know, and through this, what we see is we see that um, he depended upon God. Then we see him, you know, in Potiphar's, in Potiphar's house, we see this sense of a war. He won this war within, the, uh, of integrity, you know, and it's been said a lot. The hardest wars that we fight are the wars that are warring inside of us, where we're trying to master ourselves, that, that the, you know, denying of self, like eradicating self reliance. And instead of that, we're depending upon God. And, and, and because we're depending upon God, and then we win those wars within, we, we you know, we're able to then uh, be used by God. To, to minister to others or to, to uh, you know, to, to, to carry out God's story. And so that's what we kind of, that's what we see within Joseph's life. And that's, I think, one of the takeaways here is that, that his life, even though uh, Joseph, when we step back, we, we look at him, we say Joseph was a key figure. But when you look at his life, it was pretty rocky uh, from the perspective of the events that were taking place that he certainly didn't deserve but here's the other takeaway that I want us to understand, and this is probably the one I really want us to latch on to, is this. We're really talking about God's providence here. God is building a group of people, and He's going to use individuals, okay? But here's the deal. Can you see this picture that God's providence uses all things, okay? If we could say it that way. God's, or let me, let, I'm sorry, let me, before I jump to that one, let me say this. God's providence sustains everything. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says this, The Son, meaning Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. Remember Jesus saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And it says, sustaining all things by His powerful word. Let me read that one more time. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being sustaining all things by His powerful Word. After He had provided purification for sins, He sat down on the right hand of the Majesty in heaven. Now, what we see here, and what I'm trying to point out is this, God, sust Jesus sustains all things. God, Jesus, Jesus being part of the Godhead. God's providence sustains all things. The, all things are under His control. What I'm saying is this, Aren't there, let me, let me ask a question. Aren't there times when you look into your life or into the world and you step back and you say, how is God in control? How is God in control? Even when you just look at our nation right now and just some of the things that's happening, all the unrest, all the civil unrest, just all kinds of stuff. And then you look at, um, you look at some of the diseases and the pandemic and uh, some of the other things that's emerging. You look at just uh, wild, uh, wild, fires, and you look at, uh, you know, nature and all this other stuff um, that seems to be taking place more frequently now, and you look, you step back and you're like, is God really in control? Does God really sustain these things? Is God really sustaining all things by His powerful Word? Is that what Jesus is really doing? But that's what we see. Even in Joseph's life, we can ask that question, really, is God in control? But He is. God is sustain all things. God sustains everything. And then the second thing is this, the second takeaway that I want us to latch on to is this. God's providence, uh, the first one, God's providence sustains everything. And then secondly, His providence uses everything. In Ephesians 1, 11 and 12, it says, In Him we're also chosen, having been, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity, with the purpose of His will. Let me read that last part again. Who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will. I think the bigger picture is this. 
The bigger picture is what we see. God uses all things. He sustains all things, and He uses all things. I don't believe God causes bad things to happen. I believe God uses those things and can use those things to bring Himself glory. When we, again, this is the story that we're reading. Back in Genesis, we, when sin entered into the world, Satan came in, and now Satan is here, okay? Satan wants to do nothing more than try to destroy God. He can't do that, so the next best thing he can do is try to destroy God's creation. And he's going to wreak havoc uh, you know, on God's creation. And clear through, as we read God's story, we're reading God. Going, how God is going to bring the Messiah, the Savior, into this world um, and, and restore this chasm, this relationship that's been broken. But additionally, what we see in this story is we see the antagonist, Satan himself, throwing everything he can to, to stop that from taking place. Now, Satan does not have the same attributes as God. Satan is not all-knowing. He's not omnipresent. He's not omniscient. He's not all-powerful. He's not those things at all. He doesn't know. He's not all-knowing. He doesn't know how this is going to happen, but he can see pieces of it, and he's doing everything he can. For instance, let's go back to Moses, right? Uh, when, we talk about, when we talked about Moses, you know, where... where um, uh, you know, we're going to read about Moses here, here in a little bit, but we read about how there was an edict that came out that all Hebrew children under two, or all male children being born, was to, was to be put to death by the Egyptians. Why? Because Satan is trying to thwart God's plan. Go back to the flood. Go back to, you know, uh, sin kind of just when God looked down, there was just all this sin and, and, and he regretted it. Why? Because Satan is trying to thwart God's plan. And constantly we will see this throughout Scripture. Satan entering into the picture, trying to thwart God's plan. But what we see is God is undeterred. God can use all things. And God's providence does use all things for His glory. God can take the most negative things and turn it into the most positive. Look at Joseph's life. Even though these negative things were taking place, God used them for good. Okay? In fact, as I close, Genesis 50, chapter 50, verse 20, you've heard it numerous times. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. That's what we see in Joseph's life. We see the providence of God moving and working in Joseph's life. The key is Joseph allowed that to take place. Joseph played the role in, in this story as a protagonist that would allow God to fulfill His will in his life. Instead of Joseph becoming discouraged and depressed and bitter and staying independent, he became dependent upon God. And consequently then, he was able to minister to other people. He was able to influence other people and lead other people and accomplish things. God was able to accomplish things through Joseph that would have never been able to, to be accomplished if Joseph was about depending upon himself. And so that's what we see. We see God uses all things. God uses the most negative things, the most tragic things, and can take them and turn them to bring Himself glory. That's a tough position for you and I to be in, right? For a human to be in, to, to look at our lives and say, I don't understand why this is happening over here, but I trust that God is in control, that God is sustaining all things, and that God's going to somehow use this. So some of you may be going through something right now. If we could bridge it to this point, Maybe you're going through two things. Maybe you're going through something. Maybe you just went through something. Maybe you're carrying around some really significant baggage. Maybe this is where you just need to, and I know this sounds crazy, but to try to let it go and trust God, knowing that He, it's, let Him deal with it. Let Him take it because He can use it for His glory. The second thing is that God wants to use us in this story that's still being written. Just like Joseph back here, the events in our lives, how do we know that God doesn't want to use them regardless if they're good or if they're bad? And, and in this particular situation, we're talking about bad things. But how do we know that God doesn't want to use those things to bring Himself glory, writing the story that He's still writing today in 21st century? 
I hope you really spend some time in this. Please continue in your weekly reading and please just continue to join us either online or in person and please engage with the questions. Let us know how you're interacting so that we can all be encouraged as God is moving and writing this story. I hope you have a great week.